in the dark shadows, in the white cold, fearlessly we search for knowledge new and old. We drink the strong spirits and read ancient tomes, the older order of the Abracast. We are the brave and bold. Satanism's link with D and D. Some aspects of D and D are directly linked with Satanism. Its extent of occult collusion depends partly on the manuals selected to guide the game and formulate the dungeon master strategy. Some manuals tell players how to summon demons and indulge in astral projection. At minimum, D and D replaces reality with a contrived universe where anything goes, and moral absolutism is absent. Certain players may become so detached from the outside world that the death of their character triggers violent rage. <laughs> I imagine that's true on some level. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, it is a, it is obvious that writers for the various manuals associated with fantasy role-playing games are well-versed in the occult. Meanwhile, Gary Gygax was a... Uh, Je- um, Jehovah's, Jehovah's Witness. Witness. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> pentagrams and potions are frequently recommended in the manual. Deities and demigods. The writer advises, "quote Serving a deity is a significant part of D and D, and all player characters should have a patron god." Unquote. Isaac Bonowitz, a well-known practicing witch, considers Dungeons and Dragons such a good instructional mechanism to paganism that he has written a book showing players how to move from D and D into real sorcery. Oh, I, I wish I would have found that. That would have been interesting. Uh, his special manual on demons describes the appearance and power of evil entities with accompanying sketches. <laughs> so that's from uh, Satanism, The Seduction of America's Youth by uh, Bob Larson. <laughs> The Ages begins with the shocking story of Cain and Abel and the journey of violence and revenge spanning thousands of years, following Cain through his cursed life from an ancient invasion of malicious angels to the American Revolutionary War. A masterful, compelling journey through time, the Ages delves deep into arcane knowledge, myth, and legend. The art is stunning. And the story takes you on a journey where mortals, immortals, angels, and demons are all forced to deal with the folly that is God's creation. It's a beautifully dark and gritty ride through history. This four-part story follows the astrological procession of the ages and how each 2,500-year age parallels major changes in the development of Earth's inhabitants. Cain's blasphemous struggle with the divine and sacred tyrant God will create and crumble empires, shape history, and cause a cosmic cataclysm. The Abercast, Occult, History, Conspiracy, Violence.
All right, welcome to the Abercast. I'm your home slice, John Towers. We got a big show tonight. It's going to be, a, I believe it's probably going to be a long one, so I just want to get right to it. So I want to encourage everyone to rate and review on iTunes. Uh, I want to encourage everyone to go check out stigmatastudios.com or abercast.com. There's a bunch of social media links at the bottom, and there's also a feature topic link there where you could just go instead of searching through iTunes or wherever you get it's they're all streaming right there I'll have that set up and uh don't forget everyone's forgetting Patreon so go check out Patreon um in studio tonight we have Mike Williams hey man thank you for coming in for hey, real thank like, you for having me um so we were talking on Twitter and we start talking about the satanic panic and you brought up this Dungeons and Dragons angle yeah and I was aware of it like I you, I've never played Dungeons and Dragons, but I was I was aware of it. You know, to me, the Whipping Boys were rock and roll music, and yeah. Saturday morning cartoons is where it hit, where this whole thing hit me. But yeah, so I started thinking about this Dungeons and Dragons thing, and um, I thought that there is there was an angle that I could approach this topic where not a whole lot of people have really started talking about it. So I thought it'd be fun to have you come in, yeah, and you can help me with the Dungeons and Dragons stuff, yeah. <clears throat> oh, yeah. Cool. So, uh, before we get before we get rolling, though, you're a, an avid gamer. How long have you played uh, Dungeons and Dragons in specific? Uh, well, I've been gaming for 34 years now. Okay, cool. So you're like yeah. a level like 300 or something. <laughs> like, <laughs> I wish. <laughs> and uh, so you have some interest in uh, helping um, with chi- children who might be who might ha- be lacking some uh, element in f- using role-playing games to uh, to help them. Do you, do you want to talk about that for a second? Uh, yeah, there's been um, multiple cases where it's been proven that role-playing games have beneficial actual properties. Um, they can be educational and where they can help kids learn about reading and math. Um, they help in creativity, which, it, you know, I personally, I have what's called dysgraf- uh, dyslexia dysgraphia. It's with my handwriting and my spelling. Like, I'll read a word, and it's the word is spelled right, but to me it's wrong. Yeah. Um, well, ever, when I was in school, that I had lots of problems. You know, I didn't lo- like writing. I didn't like to do that stuff. The minute I got into D&D, I started working on character histories and did my own adventures, and slowly I've built up over time. I've gained this inherent ability to just sit down for hours and write yeah and before i couldn't do that you know um granted i gotta take breaks here and there because i do have like arm aches and whatnot right but, you know otherwise i'm able to sit there and the ideas are just rolling rolling but it helps kids with like uh social problems because if you get a group of kids that all have problems you know dealing with uh social you know I know high school can be a rough time. We all had either on the being popular side or being on the geek side. Well, right. I was on the geek side. So, <laughs> okay. You know, I got my plenty of share of, you know, uh, whirly birds and whatnot. You know, um, if you get a bunch of those kids together in a social environment, they help each other out. It's a te- It winds up becoming team a team work. building exercise, yeah. right? On top of everything else that it, it does. So right. before we started recording, I... Um, I was talking to you about uh, the uh, the alignment charts, yeah. like you know, st- if you're yeah. super good or if you're just kind of good or yeah. if you're neutral, you know, however that's all worded, and um, you know, just something as simple as like ethics on yeah. a playing field is is something that kids might not be getting today right. now off their computer right. screens and whatnot. Yeah, so. I mean, some of the games. You, I mean, my daughter plays Roblox a lot and. They're, none of the games have any type of like real moral value to them. They're all, you know, build this, destroy this, build this, destroy <laughs> this. And it's like, well, you know, aren't we teaching our kids? No wonder our kids are going around shooting each other and doing these insane things because no one's teaching them to this is not good to do. Yeah. You know, so um, so you're interested <laughs> in getting f- forming some sort of group. Yeah, I'd like to start a nonprofit organization and um, even almost like a guild um, that would focus on getting kids into the game and helping them with their, you know, social problems, their educational problems, even like a mentorship type thing where, you know, if you can help guide a kid in that way, it might change their life, you know, Uh, and where some of them kids just aren't getting guidance. That's a lot of the problem, you know, 
I grew up without a dad, so I I was lucky that I had a grandpa, and I got my guidance from there. Right. You know, um, I know a lot of kids I grew up with didn't though, mm-hmm. and they're the ones that are all in jail. You know, or dead. <laughs> in prob- you know? Yeah, with lots of problems. Cool, man. So if if you're in the Pittsburgh area or have any advice or know of a, a group like this, where the, where can people like reach out to you? Uh, my um, Twitter is at Azak30, A-Z-A-K-30, and my Facebook is uh, Facebook.com, the black slash thingy, and then uh, Clan Sunstar. Cool. Um, look, it, that or look for uh, Mikey Williams on Facebook. Um, that I, My picture isn't actually there. It's a <laughs> thing from one of the games I play, but... <laughs> Uh, All right, or you can just reach out to me, and I'll I'll, yeah. I'll, uh, I'll pass people your way uh, as we yeah. get them. So we've uh, mentioned Satanic Panic on the show, the Satanic Panic of the 80s. Yeah. I've learned to put the 80s in because it could also be applied to, like, the Salem fucking witch trials. Right. You know what I mean? Because right. it's, like, the same pattern yeah. almost. Yeah. <clears throat> um, We've mentioned the Satanic Panic of the 80s before on the show, uh, but tonight we're going to dive into it and specifically talk about one of the favorite whipping boys of the movement, Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah. So this episode is going to be a little bit of a hybrid. It's going to be a little bit of a mix match about how I deal with two separate different ep- episodes or different topics. It's going to be like half of the way that we cover the mass media topic that we've been talking about, and the other half is going to be like how we deal with the history, with our history topics okay so um to start out uh i have um we're (laughs) this is it's weird we're gonna start out we're gonna start out in the uk in the 60s okay i thought that this was a really unlikely place to start this story okay so um uh i'm going to go ahead and talk about this guy stanley cohen Okay. Stanley Cohen wrote a book called Folk Devils and Moral Panic, the creation of the mods and the rockers. Huh. So uh, he's a sociologist and he was doing research and eventually he published a book. This book that I'm talking about, Folk Devils and Moral Panic, he published it in 1972. And what it did is it analyzed the media controversies centering on the rift between the mods and the rockers. So in the 60s, there were these dandy type of guys okay. that drove around in Vespas. Yeah. And then there were like motorcycle dudes. Right. And, and um, so Cohen did this research about this media frenzy over a violent clash of two youth subcultures, culture, the mods and the rockers. Um, so there was this beach party on a bank holiday in 1964, and the mods and rockers got into a dust up that caused an estimate of $200 worth of damage and virtually no serious physical injuries on either side. But if you look back to the media coverage of this uh, thing okay. it turned into a giant they blew it up into this giant thing <laughs> so several newspapers published sensational articles surrounding the event uh cohen uh examined the articles examined he cohen examined the articles and noted a pattern of distorted facts and misrepresentations, as well as a distinct, simplistic depiction of the respective images of these two groups that were involved. Cohen went on to identify three stages of the media's reporting of these folk devils, so-called. One is uh, symbolization. The folk devil portrayed is uh, in one singular narrative, a mod or a rocker. You get all you need to know out of the two sort of images. Like the two symbols, right? Um, The overall identity is oversimplified to be easily recognizable. Now, while I'm going through this, see if you can apply it to what you already know of the Satanic Panic, or you know any kind of like moral out, like kids in cages, right? You know something that's relevant today. Okay, exaggeration, facts distorted or fabricated. Experts must be called in to explain the you know the. the situation prediction further immoral actions anticipated a call out to authorities to do something you've got to do something about these fucking mods and rockers because they're killing themselves on these beaches in this case 
of the mods and the rockers, increased police presence and fall the following year uh, on the next bank holiday led to another occurrence of violence. This is something called deviancy application amplification. Cohen noted that depictions of mods and rockers as violent, unruly troublemakers actually led in itself to the rise in more deviant behavior by these subcultures. Uh, so we're going to get into the, the book here a, just a little bit. Um, uh, and, but I highly recommend it. I highly recommend also going back and listening to the last episode we did on media effects, because even though this, we're going to be talking about this from a, so a sociological angle, you're going to be able to hear a lot of the same things. You're going to be able to pick out what is a media effect like uh, agenda setting or gatekeeping. And also uh, the mean world syndrome uh, is right here, right here. What this guy was writing in the 1960s. You're going to hear this stuff. Okay. So uh, um, carry on panicking. The objects or the objects of nor normal moral panic are rather predictable. So too are the di discursive formula. He's a British guy. You could tell because he writes uh -huh. like this. The <laughs> there is a discursive formula used to represent them. For example, they are new, lying, dormant, perhaps, but hard to recognize. Deceptively ordinary and routine, but invisibly creeping up. <laughs> to the uh, uh, moral horizon, but also old camouflaged versions of themselves, the well-known evils. They are damaging in themselves, but they are also merely a warning sign for the real, much deeper and more prevalent condi condition. They are transparent. Anyone can see what is happening, but they are also opaque. Accredited experts must explain the perils hidden in the superficial, superficially harmless. Like this is like decoding a rock song or someone looking at D and D going, Oh my God, yeah. this is real sorcery. <laughs> Um, or, uh, l yeah, looking to decode rock songs, lyrics to see how they lead to school massacres. Uh, the object of moral panic belongs to seven familiar clusters of social identity. I don't think we're going to get into the these seven um in the mid 80s however a succession of highly publicized child deaths under more ordinary circumstances led to a very different type of panic into the familiar criminal triangle child as innocent victim adult as evil perpetrator and bystander shocked but passive appears to the social worker trying to be a rescuer but somehow ending up being blamed for the whole mess uh, social workers and social service professionals were middle-class folk devils, either gullible wimps or else stormtroopers of the nanny state, either uncaring, cold-hearted bureaucrats for not inventing the time to protect the victim or overzealous do-gooding meddlers for intervening groundlessly on invading privacy. Another episode was more fictitious, and one of the purest cases of moral panic superimposed is the very real phenomenon of childhood sexual abuse and incest um, that uh, or came the recovered memory of childhood incest. Bitter debates about whether the existence of these repressed or recovered memories of childhood sexual abuse, these ther uh, therapeutic intersectices, uh, came to the story of ritual child abuse, uh, cult child abuse, or satanic child abuse. Uh, in around 1983, disturbing reports began circulating about children as well as adults in therapy who were recovering childhood memories. We're going to get into this a little bit later with Michelle Remembers. Okay. <clears throat> um, alleging that they had been sexually abused as part of the ritual of secret satanic cults, which included torture, cannibalism, <laughs> and human sacrifice. Hundreds of women were breeders. Children had their genitals mutilated and were forced to eat feces, uh, were sacrificed to Satan, and their bodies dismembered and fed to participants, who turned out to be family members, friends, neighbors, daycare providers, or prominent members of the community— or, <laughs> in some cases, huge movie stars yeah. like Chuck Norris. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Claims making uh, for various parts of the story joined conservative Christian fundamentalists with uh, feminine psychotherapists. One form of sexualized violence against children does not generate counterclaims, but its existence, nor uh, any moral disagreement. The abduction and sexual killing of children 
especially girls. This strikes a depth of horror in us all. There is a panicky sense of vulnerability, both in the sense of statistical risk <clears throat> and emotional empathy. Uh, the script becomes more familiar. Child disappears on his way home from school. The police set up an investigation team. School, friends, neighbors, teachers interviewed, frantic, distraught parents uh, make appeal on TV. Members of the public join police in searching fields and rivers and the offenders. Um, the offenders are pure candidates. Okay. Uh, media and... Media and cultural studies. There's not much more at the, uh, at their point of origin in the sixties, concepts like moral panic and deviancy amplification were symbolically linked to certain assumptions about the mass media, vital casual, uh, links were taken for granted, notably that the mass media are the primary source of the public's knowledge about the deviance and the social problems. The media appear, uh, in any or all three roles in moral panic dramas, setting the agenda, selecting those deviant or social, uh, socially problematic events deemed newsworthy or using finer filters to select which of these events are candidates for moral panic, transmitting the images, transmitting the claims of claim makers by sharpening up or dumbing down the rhetoric of moral panics, breaking the silence, making the claim uh, more frequently now than three decades ago. The media are in a cl uh, claims making business themselves. Media exposure whether the guardian's tale of the government or the sun's headline would you like a pedophile as your neighbor aim for the same moral denouement we name the guilty men these years uh, have seen moral developments and discouraged theories and analysis, but would be expected to interrogate the speeches by Brighton magistrates or editorials from the Hastings Observer as text or narratives in order to problematize, problematize their mediated representation of the distant other stance. <clears throat> uh, uh, okay, we'll skip to the end here. Justice process and uh, towards victim-centered cosmology. If the offender's background motivated and context becomes less salient, so they are easy to demonize. This contrast between dangerous predators and vulnerable in innocence allows the media to construct what Reiner terms virtual vigil vigilantism. Uh, this can be seen throughout the new realities of tabloid justice. Uh, 30 <clears throat> and in the victim culture encouraged by talk shows like Jerry Springer, these uh, uh, Dunkirkheim boundary setting uh, ceremonies continue to be staged by the mass media, but they have become desperate, incoherent and self-referential. This is because they run against shifts in media representation of crime and justice. Since the late sixties, the moral integrity of the police and other authorities is tarnished. Criminality is less an assault on sacred and consensual values than a pragmatic matter of harm and in individual victims. Above all, crime may be presented as part of the wider discourse of risk. This means that the moral panic narratives have to defend a more complex and brittle social order, uh, a less differential culture. So boiling that down, it just means the media latches onto these things and pushes them on us. And we yeah. know because of the repetitive nature of media, especially news cycles, but right. uh, it's a perfect thing for like this psychic driving sort of that we get, you know, you hear it, th you know, 30 times an hour, you know, yeah. or whatever. Oh yeah. And also where that links totally into what we're going to be talking about, but also the fact that, uh, fiction media starts to develop around these things, pushing the same agenda as the news media does. Right. Yeah. So, um, let's see. <clears throat> Uh, the Satanic Panic had three main whipping boys. I feel like I keep saying that. Rock and Roll was one of them. Cartoons and Toys was the other. And Dungeons and Dragons was probably the biggest. And from what uh, we can see or be told, it all started in around August 15th, 1979. Yeah. Is that about right? Yep. Do you want to take it for a while? I need to breathe uh, for a minute. Yeah, sure. <laughs> uh, it was uh, 1979. There was a guy named James Dallas Egbert the third. Uh, he disappeared he was a college student real smart um he played they he 
from what I my research showed that he had only played about eight hours of Dungeons and Dragons in total his whole life, but he disappeared, and his mom and them hired a private investigator to go find this kid. So the private investigator is going and asking all his friends, you know, where is this kid? Where is this kid? They're telling him, oh, we think he might have went down in these steam tunnels underneath the school. So the private investigator, you know, keeps investigating here the whole time. The kid was at one of his friend's house. Um, This caused major issues because this kid, I don't remember exactly how long it was after they found him, but he did eventually end up killing himself. Now, I think it was a year later. Yeah, it wasn't very much longer, but he uh, they don't. A lot of them don't. They don't mention in the fact that the kid was uh, a closeted homosexual. Um, he his family was really anti that, I believe. Um, he also had clinical depression. Um, he was under great duress. Um, well, he was a uh, he was super young. He got admitted to Michigan State when he was sixteen. Okay. So think of the yeah. think of the social pressure. Oh, yeah. And, and uh, just, you know, is a 16-year-old ready f- to take a shitload of college courses? And he, right, yeah. And he was 17 when he disappeared. So he'd been, like, struggling there for, for a while. Yeah. <clears throat> so they, this private investigator ends up, his, na- they, his name was William Dean. He put out a book called The Dungeon Master. In it, he acknowledged that Egbert's mom had been so domineering, it, she had more to do with his death than the actual game did. But at the same time, the guy was still kind of trying to say, I knew it all along, you know, um, his credibility wasn't very, it was kind of wishwashy after all that. Um, well, he went into it. It seems to me like he, this, uh, the private eye went into it looking to link it to Dungeons and Dragons yeah. somehow. Yeah, he like, uh, he was almost focused on that. You could find uh you could actually find interviews with him where he's like I knew, you know, I I knew it was there somewhere and he would invite the news people to go and comb these steam tunnels underneath yeah. Michigan State with them. Yeah. Just and every time they do, they're like they mention this guy, this deer dude and they're like he thinks that this kid died or got injured or lost playing dungeons and dragons so right. it's already the media latching like latching on to this totally unfounded totally nothing to do with the thing exactly and when they found the kid when they found the kid he was in louisiana working in an oil field like yeah. it had absolutely nothing to do with dungeons and dragons right like you said he had only played for like eight hours eight or hours something. total yeah like that's not enough to melt anyone's mind i no. don't think <laughs> no no, and and then on top of it, they said he was playing it in the steam tunnels. Those things aren't very well lighted, if you think about it. Yeah. And, I mean, even if you were to do the live action, those things aren't very well lighted. Right. I mean, <laughs> I don't know if you've tried to walk around in tight spaces with a, you know, four-foot-long foam-padded weapon, <laughs> but it's not as easy as people <laughs> think it is, you know. You go to turn a corner and you're poking someone's eye out. It's knocking them off a thing. That's the whole the guy's yeah. whole point, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> um, do you have anything else about this kid? Uh, not really. No, he, um, there, there was a book brought out, um, in 1984 as well by N- Neil Stevenson called the big U. It has another steam tunnel incident. Um, the only other thing based off this kid is there was a movie put out years, uh, in 82 called mazes and monsters. Mm-hmm. Um, it had Tom Hanks in it and, um, I remember seeing it on TBS. I don't remember what channel it actually came out on, but it was years after. And just watching it, you almost had to laugh at it because it was like the the one big thing about uh, gaming that people do. There is one thing you have to think about. If somebody can't distinguish reality from fantasy, they probably shouldn't play those games. (laughs) Yeah. But then at the same time, they need some type of psychological help. Right. You know, and that's that's where people need to recognize that. And that's what a lot of these people had. They didn't have that grasp on reality and that's what you get. But they, I've noticed in here, there's like, they notice they tend to go back to those steam tunnels. They tend to keep coming up with, well, they, that's where they ended up. And, or this book, you know, put out that, or they did a movie for that. Um, it was, I, I don't remember. I couldn't find an exact year, but, um, there was a guy named Jack Chick. Oh, he yeah. did the um, old Jehovah Witness um, pamphlets you would find in, like, bathrooms or the little cartoon-looking things. Mm-hmm. 
and he did one called Dark Dungeons, I believe it was yeah, called. Yeah, that's what it's called. Um, and it ended up becoming a movie, too. But that one is more sat- satire, I would have to say, because you have to, I mean, you watch it and you just laugh the whole time because you're like, nobody does this. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> like I was telling my one friend um, months ago, in my 34 years of playing, I think I've found maybe four people that probably shouldn't have played the game. And that's in between like two to three hundred other people that I know that play the game. Yeah. You know? and, and none of those four led to any kind of no. murder or suicide. No, they just they were they had a real bad grasp on reality. And those were the type of people that we were like, you know what? We're just not going to let you know when we play. Yeah. So <laughs> they, they just wouldn't show up, you know, yeah. safer that way. <clears throat> well, uh, I've mentioned on the show before, I, I was raised in a Southern Baptist church. Okay. Like it was fire and brimstone okay. every Sunday. And those Jack Chick tracks, when you mentioned yeah. that, it just took me back. I remember the whole like vestibule of the church would be lined yeah. up by Jack Chick tracks. And I would go and find like the ones with the demons and stuff on them because that those were like the creepiest ones. So right. Jack Chick was a World War II vet. Okay. And he uh he converted and he used his conversion as like a a weapon okay. you know against these you know he's seen the this evil everywhere and a yeah. lot of people will say that it was a big put on like they were like the Jack Chick tracks were made in satire yeah. on some level. And I could kind of see that for sure. But they were like, they were the two print. They, there was like purple and black yep. on the white paper or red and black on yep. the white paper. And I just wish I had a collection of them now. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure, you know, if you had them in your house in like five or 10 years, I'm sure they would be like, why do you have this hate speech? Right. You know, whatever. But right. they were just so weird and, and creepy. I used to find them when I worked down in Pittsburgh uh, at the Fifth Avenue place. I was a baker for the eyeball pan there. Oh, and- they would just throw them in there. I in the yeah. bathroom, yeah. You would, I'd go in the bathroom and there would there be them, and that, so that was my reading material at <laughs> night, you know. Yeah. So growing up Southern Baptist, I can't tell you how many versions of this Egbert story that I've heard, yeah. you know, about kids dying yeah. or like when they're, um, when their character dies in the game, they like throw themselves yeah. off a cliff and stuff. like you hear it all just constantly. Yeah. And my mom was one of those ones where she's like, don't even think about touching that Ouija board. Like she, like she was all in. Yeah. And, um, and it's just so weird because I think about it now and like one of my good friends in the church, his dad was like the deacon. And that's actually how I knew what Dungeons and Dragons was is because he played. You go over okay. to his house and he'd have stacks and stacks of graph paper and like all these weird esoteric dice, you yeah. know, that I've never seen before. And it was like, it was like an adult thing that right. I had no idea what was going on. Right. You know, uh, but he also had like one of the first apple computers i've ever seen so i learned how to play bard's tale on this guy on this guy's computer you know which is basically like a dungeons and dragons yeah it's definitely inspired definitely yeah so it's just like it's weird i'm like doing this research and i'm just like i can't believe like all the bullshit that i've heard just came from this one kid's fucking story you know it came from his and there were only a couple that they were able to like in every case that they found some a kid committed suicide or there was a murder involved, there's other factors involved that could have caused this the situation, and they they always seem to focus right on D and D or on heavy metal or, uh, I mean I know uh, I was watching the one video and it brought up about the Jewish priest being sued. Oh, yeah. Um, and it it was like right on the end of them talking about the D and D thing, and it was like, yeah, you know, that all does kind of tie in together because uh-huh. the minute like they saw like especially in my I was a I listened to metal as a kid and I played D and D, so I had it from both angles <laughs> where you were on two gateway drugs to see yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah, and and I've I've you know I had the the one guy we had a dad who um he was really. I don't want to say he was Catholic, but he was really religious and he didn't want his son playing. And he, he agreed to sit down and, and listen to our side of it. And I sat him down and I said, look, 
all those things you've heard about these spells are real and that people actually worship these gods and that you can gain all these powers and stuff. I said, if, if that was real, do you really think we'd be sitting here right now? <laughs> I would be running the world and there would, you know. <laughs> what a great argument. Yeah. <laughs> and so, I mean, because I've learned this game for, you know, at the time it was like maybe 15, 20 years I was into it at that point. But I definitely had my 10,000 hours in and I, I'm sure, you know, if that would be real, I was a prime example of I should have this power. Where is it? Yeah. You know, I'm kind of disappointed <laughs> I don't have it. Right. You know. Yeah. Um. So I think like. I, in my notes, uh, we have Patricia Poling. Oh, right. That's we didn't lady. even talk about her. Yeah. yeah. Um, she <clears throat> started the Bothered Against Dungeons and Dragons after her son, Irving, committed suicide in June 9th of 1982. Uh, she died in 1997. He, I believe he committed suicide by shooting himself in the chest in the yard, I think. <clears throat> I, don't, I don't remember where, but. Uh, yeah, I don't have anything about that. I, I mean, I'm aware of her, but I don't, I don't yeah. have anything about her story. I do know, I think it's interesting that as a mother of a, a child who had committed suicide, she was so eager to plan it on somewhere else, you yeah. know? And, um, I imagine that's a super normal thing to, to happen. You know what I mean? Yeah. People like, definitely want looking look, you know, for an, an answer or a yeah. reason. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, she became a staple in the media. Oh, like yeah. it, she was on the news all the time. As soon as I saw, a, I was watching an interview with her and I was like, Oh, I, I remember yeah. that bitch, you know? Yeah. <clears throat> um, but she, um, after she first tried suing the principal of the high school, because that's who was running the games. Yeah. Um, and I think I might've actually got my information mixed up. I think, yeah, it was Irving who was the one that only played eight hours of D and D. Okay. Not the other guy. He might've actually played more, but Irving had only to played a total of eight hours of D and D. And, um, the principal was the one running it. Well, she tried suing him. That case didn't, it got thrown out. Then she tried suing TSR, the makers that made D and D. That case got thrown out, and that's when she started creating uh, her bad on the bother against Dungeons and Dragons. Do you know if she tried to sue TSR or did yeah. she try to sue Gaiax? I don't know if she tried suing him directly, but okay. she did try going after the company. Yeah, and it's funny because like after the Egbert thing, I found this thing where Gaiax was talking, and he was like our sales skyrocketed after yeah. that, <laughs> yeah. you know, so it was like the Streisand effect, you yeah. know, on this, uh, like on the, uh, the sale of these games. Yeah. They were talking about how a lot of the experts were going out and buying all the books so they could go through and look and uh, TSR. It's just like, thank you. Cause yeah. you're, you're helping our sales, you know, <laughs> yeah. but yeah, they were, uh, they, that was the, I believe she was a majority of the misinformation and the, the drive behind the whole thing like once she kind of picked it up she was the one who kept pushing the issue and pushing the issue and well and she she got to look at mad yeah. you know she got to look at other these uh parental um organizations, organizations. Yeah. and i mean you could see it right there in the title like it's yeah. totally like oh she's like oh i'm not mad i'm bad yeah <laughs> yep yep but uh <clears throat> she claimed her son had a D D curse on his character um Shortly before they, oh, uh, yeah, before he killed himself. Uh, and that was the reason why he committed suicide. And uh, that just boggles my mind. I don't understand that. Like I said, the the, the spells in the game are literally, they're not, they're, they aren't real spells in any way, shape, or form. Yeah. I, I wish they were. Cause, <laughs> you I would mean, be running shit. <laughs> right? There, there's a wish spell right in there, you know. I, it, uh, I, I'm sure I could have tested out Fireball quite a few times in my life, you know. But they, uh, yeah, she tried suing TSR. All the lawsuits she had were dismissed. And she started publishing pamphlets circulating her beliefs that D&D encouraged devil worshipping and suicide. Um. She described D&D as a fantasy role-playing game which uses demonology, witchcraft, voodoo, murder, rape, blasphemy, suicide, assassination, insanity, sexual perversion, homosexuality, prostitution, 
satanic type rituals, gambling, barbarianism, cannibalism, sadism, uh, desecration, demon summoning, necromantics, divinitations, and other teachings. That's so weird because it's like, generally speaking, it, all that stuff probably could be in one game or the other. Right. But, but they're not talking about the ethics. Like, right. The good guys do heroic stuff that's the type of stuff you're going to fight yeah, yeah it's just like it's just like in lord of the rings being like oh don't yeah. read tolkien because of all of this stuff and you're like well don't that's all the stuff that the bad guys do you know like <laughs> exactly <laughs> it's, um, it's wild man it's crazy she convinced people through con, uh through the conser- christian conservative media and um constantly bombarding the mainstream media outlets as you said you know talk shows she, i can remember watching her on uh sally jesse, sally Raffia, jesse Raffia, yeah then phil donahue and then on geraldo like um, it was almost like one right after another um she put out a book in 1989 called the devil's web who is stalking your children for satan uh-huh. which she makes no distinction between hp lovecraft's necronomicon and the Simon Necronomicon, um, which they uh, so the Necronomicon in are both fictional. They're both yeah. Uh, it, it was made up by H.P. Uh, Lovecraft. Is this like ancient evil book? It's just like a through line for a lot of his stories. You know, like yeah. how people would mention like the Bible or like right. Rachel Ray's cooking book or whatever. Right. It, he just used it like that. And it, actually, when you read Lovecraft in each story, it's, yeah. it fits to the story. It's never, yeah. it's ne- it's never always a spell book. Exactly. It's never always a his like a right. secret history. I think book. in fact, a couple of his stories, it's just sitting there. Yeah. It, it, he just tell says it's there, you know? Yeah. Um, um, but I, somewhere along the lines in, I think 79 or yeah, maybe 78, it was like 79, 78, Eight, yeah, eighty. Some, somebody published a version, yeah, of an actual book. Well, Some that, people say it's Kenneth Grant. I don't even know if he was alive at the time. Yeah, I, I I'm not remember. sure who it was. Yeah, uh, but they well they published it under the Mad Arab Abdul yeah. Al Hazarad's name, which coincides with what happens in HP Love in the HP Lovecraft. Yeah, but pure, purely, it. I mean, it was just like a conversation like it was right. just something like it's not a real magical term. right in but fact it- <laughs> there's uh copies of it where like the first uh four pages get copied right after that like they four pages and then the same exact wording <laughs> is in the next four pages and that just goes that's the whole book yeah like there was one copy of it like that i, I read um but yeah she was trying to associate that with um being a real book and I know from personal experience, I had an ex-girlfriend who her, her his mother actually like told me I, I couldn't date her anymore because I had lent my ex-girlfriend this book. And <laughs> she was like, what's this sigil on the cover? Yeah, Fuck you're, this. you're yeah. satanic. You know? yeah. And yeah, so I wasn't able to date that girl. But yeah, and then years <laughs> later to find out it was totally it's just, bogus, you know. Yeah. It, um, it, yeah it's, it's just like, like a publicity. It's like a publicity stunt or whatever. Yeah. Um, uh, but it's funny because I think like. Uh, there is a uh, in deities and demigods like our there old was pal, the original like, yeah Al, like Bob Larson said uh, in deities and demigods there actually is a section for the Cthulhu mythos yeah in the very first edition uh, that they did for that they did do the Cthulhu mythos I don't know if they did it in recent ones but um yeah they had that out um that's the first time I ever heard of Cthulhu like yeah first you know I was. I wasn't reading H.P. Lovecraft at the time. I was right. reading my buddy's dad's monster manuals yeah. and stuff. And I'm like, what the fuck is this? It's so crazy. Yeah. You know, and then he winds up becoming on, uh, he winds up doing an appearance on the real Ghostbusters at one point. Okay. C- Cthulhu, the collect call for Cthulhu. Okay. Yeah. You know? And I, I was big into that show and I'm like, oh my God, there it is again. There's this Cthulhu character. You know, yeah. it wasn't until years later where I'm like, oh, H.P. Lovecraft, I get it. Which they <clears throat> I, they actually have just a game that is just Cthulhu. Yeah. It is um, its own game called Cthulhu, but it's, uh, you know, I'm sure people that play that game, get annoyed with the whole Nef- 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 oh, I'm sure. reference yeah. constantly. I'm to, sure, yeah, I'm sure they do. Um, <clears throat> but the, uh, Patricia Pulling obtained a private investigator's license, became a consultant for law enforcement, was an expert witness at se- uh, several gaming-related lawsuits, all which lost in court. And that's, you know, that shows, like, this lady didn't have any experience. Oh, yeah. So how is she, you know, and that's what, I, as I was saying, like, you'll see that people were 
becoming experts when they really had no, they didn't know what they were talking about. You're like an expert just off of what you heard on Geraldo. Exactly. You know what I mean? Like, I'm an expert at passing the rumor along. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, that's right. Um, but yeah, she put out that book in um, 1989, The Devil's Web, um, and then tried to say that uh, the Necronomicon and the Simon Necronomicon were exactly the same book. Um, she encouraged police to ask suspected occultists, have you read the Necronomicon or are you familiar <laughs> with it? Um, she had this whole list of like, what level is your dungeon master? What, you know, who is the dungeon master? I think you brought that up earlier, but yeah, she was the one who encouraged cops to go around asking all these questions. And one of the things was, um, what class are you or what, are you a thief or you're a wizard? Are you a mage? And like there was, um, they weren't the police weren't supposed to ex, uh, accept the fact that people might play more than one character. Oh, okay. So when <clears throat> you would say, "Well, I have a, a rogue and I have a cleric," you know, they're supposed to know which one are you. So you're arguing with the cop, like, "Well, I'm the I'm the other one. I, I this, play them both." But, and this know. cop's in the back of his mind. He's like, "This kid's so mixed up. He's got two personalities. Right? Yeah, yeah like... one of the personality. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what was the other one they did? Um, Oh, there was like, you could play multi-class and I guess that was supposed to be like some type of, uh, you're like one of the main ringleaders of the group be it by playing that. I don't even and, understand the re like the logic behind yeah, it. That, even like normie log looking at it from the outside. I'm yeah. like, I don't even understand that. It, 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 when you look back at some of this stuff, like it, it was a good laugh. I, I really, uh, like I said, the one website I go to is called the escapist and, uh, they they just literally every argument they ever made about it they go through and rip it apart. Oh really? And yeah. Cool. Um, there was a guy. Um, what's his name? Michael P or Michael A Stackwell. He actually wrote what's called the pulling report. He went through and literally took everything Patricia Pulling said. And one of the things that she did was um, she made this statement. She went into D and D. Uh, I think the player's handbook or no the DM's guide. And she tried to make this claim of, well, it says uh, this. Well, she, let me actually find this because she made these claims, these really outlandish claims. And she basically took like a paragraph. Here we go. Um, she took this paragraph out of context and then made a minor alteration to it. Um, here we go. Wait, no, that ain't the right one. There we go. Uh, these are the... I'm going to read her statement. Okay. Okay. This is what she initially said. It's good wife... Um, wait, I lost it here. It mentions... Uh, okay. Good wife... Description... Uh, da, da, da. Uh, here we go. Good wife encounters are with single women. Any seeming uh, party of assault, rape theft and murder that was what she used in her uh one of her 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 books statements yeah one okay. of her books in the devil's web actually page 85 uh second paragraph now if you actually read the entire paragraph of what she pulled that from it says good wife encounters are with single women often indistinguishable from any other type of female such as a magic user comma harlot etc any offensive treatment of seeming uh, threat will be likely to cause the woman to scream for help, accuse the offending party of any number of crimes, i.e. assault, rape, theft, or murder. 20% of good wives know interesting gossip. That <laughs> So you can see where she took the little pieces she wanted to and created yeah. a, a statement that was completely fake. But yeah, there's she did a lot of that. And um, this guy, Michael Stackpole, he went through and literally just tore her Jeez. apart and everything. But he, he did. Uh, it's actually on the Internet. You can look it up. It's called The Pooling Report. And uh, it, it's actually a very good read because it he goes into some of the educational like benefits of gaming and whatnot, too, um, which I'm actually yeah, that's where I got to. Cool. Um, Hit me. Uh, he. He wrote a book in 89 called uh, Game Hysteria and the Truth. It breaks down. Patricia Pooling's argument and pointed out all the flaws, misconceptions, inaccuracies, and omission of irrelevant details. It also pointed out questionable practices such as editing newspaper accounts. Um, she would literally like take 
newspaper articles, put them in her little pamphlets, <laughs> and change words, and then never contact the newspapers to tell them, hey, I'm using this article. Wow. So that's he was able to use that to say, look, she, I mean, she's not even being credible in any way, shape, or form. <laughs> uh, but with all that, over that was around 1980, or 1990s when he put out the polling report which is a review highly critical of BADS methods of data collection, analysis, and reporting. <laughs> How many people do you think has made a character based on polling? Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm sure there's been at least a couple hundred DMs that have used her as some type of witch or demon or something. It's like bad. I'm sure, yeah. She's got a bad ethics I mean, role. If She's there <laughs> isn't, I'm, I might just have to do that. You know, I, I'm, I haven't had a game in a while, and I might just, I might just have to come up with one like that. That, that might be fun. <laughs> But yeah, that'd be kind of fun to go through and take all these people that have made fun of the game or, or not so much made fun, but accused it of things yeah. and make them villains. And you know, <laughs> yeah. I might have actually have to do that. Um, but yeah, he wrote the pulling report in 1990. Um, he determined she misrepresented her, her credentials. She left bad in 1990. And I believe it survived until she died in 97. Really? Yeah. So it hung around that long. It, yeah. Uh, I don't know who ran it. Or, they, there really wasn't that much detail about it. Yeah. it ex- everything I found about it was under her. So I'm sure, like, through her books and she whatnot. She probably had some, a couple board, like a dr- little board of directors yeah. or something. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, in 91, the American Association of Suicide, Suicidology, the CDC and the Health and Welfare Organization of Canada um, all basically did uh, studies, and they all came to the same conclusion that role-playing games do not commit or do not cause people to commit suicide. Um, if anything, the statistics prove that gamers are less likely to commit suicide because during the 80s there was that teen suicide epidemic yep. for a while there, and gamers if you took how many people that they claimed that were gamers were doing it it's a really low percentage and that's oh that was something that was another thing with pooling that i just thought about um one newspaper claimed that patricia pooling said that eight percent of richmond virginia were satanists she got that (laughs) figure by estimating four percent of adults and four percent children are satanists now when the guy tried to correct her and explain to her that four percent and four percent would equal up to four percent she looked at him and said 8% is a conservative number. It, uh, yeah. I'm trying to think of like why she's picking on Richmond. I don't like, know. She run into like a Guar concert and was like, yeah, what that, the fuck? Yeah. <laughs> I don't understand. Like, you know, you hear like they, they were anti Aussie and anti Judas priest. And then you think like, did these people never see Guar? Yeah. Like, did they never want well, this here Slayer? I mean, you know, but yeah, they, uh, but yeah, they also connect, uh, concluded the, that uh, the these three organizations that there are no casual link between fantasy gaming and suicide. Um, well, nowadays I saw that there's actually therapists that are using role playing. Yes, it, it, I don't know if they're having them fight dragons and shit, but they're using. Nah, you can, I mean, you don't have to have combat. In yeah, it. you can come up with you know tasks. It's just um, a way to, like we said before, like team build yeah. or. You know, just work through some of your bullshit like right. in a role playing game. I think that would be right. super interesting to see some data about that. Yeah, I definitely, I, I know it would definitely would work that way. Um, I'm like part of my the organization. I want to do but like one of the things that I want to use or offer with it is, um, going to different corporations and doing team building exercises via role playing games. Yes. Yeah. It's like, hey, you don't have to go and get shot with paintballs. Exactly. Like, you know, we can yeah. just do it right here. Yep. And <laughs> it it'll cost you a lot less, believe me. Yeah. You know, um I'm trying to think. There was one other case I could think up and that was the Lee von Stein case. Uh, it was a 1988 murder case. Um Chris Pritchard who was the Leaf Leaf von stein's uh stepson okay masterminded the murder of his stepfather for a two million dollar uh fortune um the thing that he played dungeons and dragons a little bit but like there there were two crime authors joe mcginnis and jerry bedslow they played the rpg angle up for that case they're the ones who really like fan the flames for that um I'm pretty sure that was just he wanted the money, and they were able to prove that it was straight with that. 
Um, and I believe it was 89. TSR actually removed all references to demons and devils out of Dungeons and Dragons. They, really? They changed the names. I believe uh, demons were called um, Tanari and the devils were called Bezatu. It okay. might be reversed. I can't remember, but they pulled them out and they uh, they put they created these two new uh, races as they called them. But they that's what they became. So they weren't called them demons and devils. Oh, okay, I was totally unaware of that. Um, I mean, I don't know why I think I would have been aware of it, but <laughs> yeah. But in two thousand uh, third edition, addressed demons and devils far more explicitly. Um, the relations and interactions with explicitly describe as evil when dealing with uh, either creature. So essentially, if you're not trying to kill it, you're doing something bad. And that they explicitly, you know, made that a point in the game now, or at least in third edition. They actually put out um, two mature audience only books. One was um, the book of vile darkness and the other one was the book of exalted deeds. Um, one was all good and one was evil, and they had like all the demon and devil lords and and the evil one, and then they had like um, angel lords and uh, archons and stuff in the other one. But they they had mature content because of all this stuff. Yeah, they put that mm-hmm. label on there just to say, hey, you know, you might want to make sure you know there's nobody trying to say you're you know worshiping. Stuff. Well, that's pretty cool of them to make that little gap there give that little wiggle room yeah you know in there for people that are still skittish about the whole yeah thing. you don't have to actually use them in the game it's that and that's the one thing about role-playing games to begin with in any game like you said you played riffs i've played uh, me and my friend ran multiple riffs games where like one guy might be playing a dragon but then like we've run them where everybody was a person like yeah. a human you know you don't have to use every aspect of the game when you run the game right right you know it, it's your story you tell it the way you want and that's like with this organization I want to start that's something I want to like work with parents and uh, allay their worries that you know we're not here to try and get your kids in to start worshiping devils you know <laughs> it's not our purpose it's not our goal you know if you want, sit down with us. We'll show you how the game runs. You yeah. Know? I mean, that's powerful. It, like, play play a game with us. Yeah. You know, that would be really cool. Yeah. And and like, like I said, it brings out, you know, the whole getting them off the computer. It it gets I your kids so out. that's so clutch, man. Yeah. Jesus. Uh, and uh, honestly, I think parents will get behind that 100% just on the fact of, <clears> you know, if the kid don't have a phone in their hand, they're at a laptop or a desk, you know, on a Staring console at a TV. something. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's everywhere. It's yeah. I mean, I I thought Atari was bad. And, you know, <laughs> oh, <laughs> my daughter handed me one. Um, I think she plays Minecraft. I can't play it. I I, I destroyed everything that she built. <laughs> I, I went around blowing everything up just because that's my goal. You know, but um, there's only one other individual I have information on that in uh, involved the Satanic Panic of D and D, and I. I wish I could pronounce his name right. It's Schneblin. Um, this guy was a former Wiccan and Satanic priest. He claims that he was a former Wiccan and Satanic priest. Also claims to be a vampire. Um, he wrote Straight Talk on Dungeons and Dragons in 1989. Is this the guy that Bob Larson was talking about? It might be. Let me see. Go ahead. Um, in 2001, he wrote a article, Should um, Christians Play Dungeons and Dragons? He makes the claim that he and his wife were consulted during the making of D&D to ensure spells were authentic, um, yet nobody in uh, that in, in that was there remembers anybody from there talking to them. Um, I I paid a lot of attention to like I, the history of the company and the game and whatnot, and. This guy has just made some outlandish claims that basically, <laughs> you know, he claims to know werewolves. He's a vampire. He he claims he, you know, all these spells he helped create. And it's, you just look at it and you just go, well, then why is your name not in any of the books? Yeah. Anywhere. You know, not, you haven't ever been mentioned until you put an article out. So what'd you say this guy's name was? Um, Schneblin. Schneblin. The yeah. guy that Larson's talking about is he's a- Isaac Bonewitz. Nah. But he's saying the same thing. A well-known practicing witch considers Dungeons and Dragons a good instructional mechanism to paganism. He has written a book showing players how to move from D&D into real sorcery. Yeah. His special manual on demons describes the 
appearance and powers of evil entities and accompanying sketches. Huh. So there's at least two of these guys that are running yeah. around doing this. Yeah. So yeah, it does still continue to this day. Um, like, I think the most recent one I heard about was Pat Robertson. Um, I think it was in 2014. They were talking about something. And just out of nowhere on air, he mentions Dungeons and Dragons as an evil game. And he had a flashback to the 1980s. Yeah, and I'm, I'm like, wow, you know, whatever he's taking, hand it out, you know. I think we all need a little of that. But I think, I think like the the satanic ritual abuse was like the end of the. That was like where all these things were taking us as kids. Yeah. And I think like the cartoons and the Dungeons and Dragons and the heavy metal the, music. It was all kind of like the build up to. It was just kind of like the little, it's the initiational phase or whatever. Yeah. Like how you get seduced by, you know, the, by the devil worshipers and stuff. Um, but yeah, just as a second, since I just mentioned cartoons, like I remember... I remember talking to people and they were like, look, these Smurfs are demons. Yeah. And I'm like, no, they're communists. Like they're not, <laughs> they're not demons. <laughs> they're the furthest thing from demons I have ever seen, you know? Um, yeah. So I just thought, like, I think this whole, the whole thing is interesting. And I think we're a lot of people that dissect this topic. Like they're like, oh, these people were so gullible that they just, that they hurt like They'll almost believe anything. Yeah, and like on their like in their brain, they're like taking it out of context. They're like they heard it once on sixty minutes, and this yeah. is what they thought. Where it wasn't like that. It was like the fucking Geraldo Rivera show. It was the it was sixty minutes, <laughs> right. like super respected journalists that have, were taken seriously. Right. Were Ed, fucking Ed Bradley yeah. was sitting there yeah. was sitting there doing a D and D segment. He interviewed uh, Gary Gaix actually during that. Really, I, I watched it. Yeah, and uh, Gary Gaix the whole time saying it's just a game. Yeah, I mean it's no different than Monopoly. The the rent and the um, um, property and Monopoly is not real. The money is not real. So I mean, <laughs> you don't people aren't going bankrupt after playing a game of Monopoly. It's not going to happen. Valid you know? point. V- valid yeah. point. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's just like it wasn't just like they they saw one thing on Phil Donahue and were like, oh my god. It was just like my point is is that it was it was everywhere. Oh, like yeah. It was just bam, bam, just D and D after D and D after D and D. And then you go to, you go to church and you find the Jack chick track, you know, dark, yeah. dark dungeons. Yeah. And then, oh, uh, yeah. You know, and then on your way home, you get to listen to the pastor on the radio, hellfire and brimstone against dungeons right. and dragons. You know, I, re- I remember one specific day I was watching GI Joe as a kid and that ended and I changed the channel and it went to one of the religious stations and they were talking bad about D and D. And so I switched that channel and it went to another channel that it was a news story about something bad about D and D, and as it was like that day was just my day to not watch TV because <laughs> I, everything was bad. And I do remember it got constantly connected. Like you would go to the store just to buy the books, and I mean, I was I started playing when I was ten, um, so I was probably like fifteen, sixteen when I started actually going to different like stores like Walden Books. Um, I can't remember half of them that were around back then, but. I'd go in these places and I'd buy the, I'd grab the books and I'd be standing in line. You don't know how many times someone would tap me on the shoulder and go, Sonny, that's evil. <laughs> and I'd have to look at them and go, no, it's, it's a book. Yeah. It's no different than that book or that book. Yeah. You know, it's, it's a book. It's just a, it's just a cooler version of risk. You yeah. Know, or, or, you know, sorry or what, like whatever you want to equate yeah. it to. Yeah. <clears throat> um, so, all right, so we're talking about Egbert's case, and uh, he winds up in Louisiana, and then a year, he calls the private investigator that's been looking yeah. for him. That's how much press this guy's been getting. Like, yeah. he actually knew where to call this guy. So he calls the guy, and he's like, come and get me, I'm in Louisiana. Yeah. So on the way home, he was like, look, you can't tell anybody my my story. Like, right. he asked him for, you know, his his protect to keep his mouth shut about right. what it, what had happened. So that kind of goes with what you're saying where he's just embarrassed because it, yeah. he, he hasn't come out or that he was depressed. Or, I also had heard that he was making his own acid and meth. Methadone? I had not heard that. I heard yeah. he was working in an oil field, which I thought was interesting. Yeah. See, I, yeah, I heard he was on, uh, <laughs> making his own acid and methadone. And that's part of the problem that caused his little uh, downslide. Yeah. But, so it's like a year later, go, uh, self-inflicted gunshot wound to the head. He had killed himself. Yeah. And that's when this dude wrote his, wrote his book and his, um, I have it written down. The, 
The, dun- the Dungeon Master? Yeah, he, okay, yeah. Yeah. So he wrote The Dungeon Master. So again, linking it back to this idea that he propagated. He yeah. started all of this Egbert, the Dungeons and Dragons aspect in this Egbert case. So even though that he didn't die for a year after they had, he had been found, it's still inexorably linked through oh, yeah. time that this is what happened to this fucking kid, you know? Yep. And think about that. What if that had something to do with him committing suicide? Like right, this yeah. media, the all this media coverage yeah. and stuff. Um, so, uh, uh, the ball's rolling, you know, and and I, you know, like I said, I can't tell you how often that I've heard a variation of this story. You know, this, there was this coming storm, uh, the satanic panic. It was eminent. Um, you know, people were out there and they were worship, you know, worshiping Satan. And, you know, you talk about like this, uh, this rising, uh, Christian, evangelical movement you know the the moral majority yeah. and you talk about uh the war on drugs i think that it that all created this atmosphere where this this could have happened you know what i mean yeah you have to remember back in, from the 70s into the eight, early 80s we were all being groomed with the whole stranger danger the even the halloween candy thing oh yeah yeah um but- it, that's one isolated case of somebody poisoning their own kid, but everybody now in America has to check the Halloween fucking candy. razor blades and arsenic and all. Yeah. Everything. yeah. So you have to like we it started to slowly get built up into where. I mean, we're, it was almost to a point where they were putting bubble wrap around us, you know, at some point, you know, like trying to protect us from everything. And. I think that caused a large majority of us to go, not nope, get this off me, go. <laughs> yeah. You know. Well, that's interesting. That's the uh, deviance amplification like, yeah. in some level. Like, oh, you know, you don't want me to eat. You need to check my fucking candy on Halloween. Well, right. let me go draw some pentagrams on some shit and see how you like that. Right. <clears throat> so um, this we need to talk a minute about SRA, which is the satanic ritual abuse. Okay. So basically it kicked off, it got cu- kicked off by another media construct. It got kicked off by this book called Michelle remembers, which was published yeah. in 1980 yeah. uh, by this lady, Michelle Smith. And she had a husband who was a psychiatrist. So who knows what kind of games he was fucking playing with her, you know? Um, the premise of the book was that Michelle had suppressed memories of being a victim of a cult of Satan worshipers. And um, through psychiatric means, her husband was able to recover these memories from her. Right. Uh, the book detailed, again, you're going to hear a lot of the same shit. The book detailed years of torture, being locked in cages, sexual assault, forced uh into rituals uh, with dead and dismembered babies and so on and so forth. And all of this was eventually debunked, but the damage had been done. The stories in this book acted like a template for dozens, if not hundreds of people uh, who claimed to be uh, SRA uh, recover, recover memory cases for the next decade. This happened until like the early nineties. People were coming up with, with this and it was all like this, template it's it reminds me so much of the ufo thing like yeah. kenneth arnold's like man i saw some fucking ufos up there they were skipping across the sky like saucers yeah someone read every other word of that and was like hey i saw flying saucers too and the next thing you know like the whole universe is running around talking about flying saucers exactly you know when he described <laughs> kenneth arnold described them as boomerangs that right. skipped across the sky as saucers right. <clears throat> the other problem with a lot of these books too is it, it all these people all of a sudden started becoming experts in sat- satanic rituals and all these other things that they honestly had no idea what they were talking about. They were just going along with the flow of things that they were being fed to them, essentially. Yeah. Like, I saw one guy talking about, we're going to kind of go back a little bit. I saw one guy talking about Dungeons and Dragons, and he was talking about the offensive, like, the dangerous parts of Dungeons yeah. and Dragons. And one of the things he brought up that I never had thought of ever was the Dungeon Master and how the Dungeon Master is basically the god of the the game. Yeah. And he felt like he was like, that affronted, that affronted him that, you know, that someone could be taking the role of, of God, you know, in a yeah. Dungeons and Dragons game. And I'm like, I don't think about it at all because there's a, tons of rules of systems that are in place. That, like he can't just do whatever he wants to do. I exactly. Mean, and, and it may, ma, the majority of DMing is telling a story. It's a lot of it is, yeah, making sure the rules are, you know, adhered to and whatnot. But 
the, that usually the main focus is you know telling a story and in a way yeah you kind of do have to be a god in a way by you know like you have to create your own little worlds or your own um you know modules events adventures um you have to you know set all these things up in this world you pretend to be the, all the npcs that the players aren't i mean so yeah in some senses you are one uh, god in your own little reality but most people can look at that and go that's that reality. This right. is our reality now, <laughs> yeah. you know. It's just imagine some guy being like, wait, you want to shoot that basketball? You better roll. Yeah. You know, or like, <laughs> oh, you oh, you better roll for check. initiative. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Give me a dex check. <laughs> so uh, another part of the Satanic Panic that we're going to talk about is the McMartin preschool trial. Oh, okay. So in 1983, this is where Chuck Norris comes in. Yeah. For everyone that's been waiting for Chuck Norris to drop. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, there was this preschool in California that got in trouble for allegations of Satanic ritual abuse. And they were like bizarre yeah. things. And it was like uh, traveling in hot air balloons yeah. being transported to uh, the basement by being flushed down a toilet. Yeah. Yeah. And cleaned up and let brought back up. That, yeah. That was, yeah. Yeah. Uh, raped by Chuck Norris, which yeah. I was like, well, how dare he? You know? Right. <laughs> uh, it, and then uh, the thing, the things about kids being flushed down toilets is just weird because we actually see like an echo of that in this all this PizzaGate stuff. Yeah, like you know, like it's yeah, a lot of that is like a failed moral panic where everyone's just right. like, I don't even want to look at that, you know. Yeah, but it has a lot of like the same earmarks. You know, if yeah. Instagram was around, exactly. you know, people would be like, "What the fuck is this preschool doing?" <laughs> right, right, yeah, <laughs> yeah, all sorts. Of, I'm I'm sure they would, you know, is that sliding board have a pentagram on it yeah you know? right uh so this trial eventually costed 15 million taxpayer dollars and it was at least at one point in time the most expensive criminal case in u.s history yeah that led to zero convictions yeah, nobody <laughs> it, it ruined lives yeah completely yeah. it's it's still i mean a lot of the people that were brought up on charges have since passed away yeah but i'm sure they just had to live the rest of their lives as fucking like hermits, oh yeah you know yeah, yeah, because there's a, the social stigma attached to that. You know, people, whether or not, you know, even if you look at it this, like, even if OJ did it, he was still, proved, like, they said he, he didn't do it. They, you know, he was found not guilty. Right. So even if you think he did it, you know, you you still attach that stigmata to him. And that happens with all those types of cases. I mean, it, it just, and that's something like, I don't know. My grandparents taught me, like, if, if the courts find somebody innocent, hey, they're innocent. You can't do you nothing. You have to kind of uh, Let them acquiesce go. to the, you know, respect the, the rule of law. Yeah. You know, at, however, the jury, you know, you weren't in the jury room. You don't know. Right. You know, you didn't hear all the evidence. Right. You know. <clears throat> yeah. That's wise words. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um. So it led to no conviction, convictions. However, the accusations, be, they became a template. And then yep. if dozens, if not hundreds of these cases. schools, preschools, church nurseries, like all, all of this stuff, like all of this stuff. And yep. it wasn't just, I have a feeling I have to keep saying it. It wasn't just like this one person read one magazine article about it. It yeah, was being no, pushed they, everywhere. They like, were putting pamphlets out. It was in books. It was, I remember, like I said, I bought so many, my grandparents were, weren't Catholic. They were Christian, but they... They didn't watch. They weren't like all um, that deep into it. They were pretty relaxed. Um, they would put that on every so often, and when it came on, and they were talking about like that type of stuff, they would turn the channel. Um, that was the one good thing about my grandparents is they were they they actually looked at the books and they read them and said it's just a game. You know, you, yeah. they don't care. But <laughs> good luck. Um, yeah, you know, <laughs> they saw that it brought creativity out in me, and they appreciated that. You know. Um, that was something my grandpa always told me, use your mind, don't use your body, because I'm short, a little guy, <laughs> you're not going to get too far, you know, it, it just happened out that way, but uh, that was, yeah, like, and that's how a lot, I've had a lot of parent like, talking with parents a lot, and I've had to sit them down and go, look, if you just give me five minutes, and you lo read this book, I guarantee you'll just look and go, there's, this is nothing, Yeah, you know, and most of them, it ends up doing that, and, but it, it uh that's they all have like like i don't know how many times i've all heard them say the same thing you know like what kind of rituals are you casting <laughs> you know what kind of 
<laughs> are you how many kids have you sacrificed you know and I'm, I'm like i don't know what you're talking about like yeah if i were doing all that wouldn't you think i'd be in jail or investigated by now <laughs> yeah. you know? like i've read uh the lesser key of Solomon. it took me three hours to yeah. get through it like these yeah. kids aren't going aren't summoning demons <laughs> yeah no not happening no <clears throat> um so you add these you add these giant ingredients to the mix and then you add uh, the rise of the moral majority and the Jimmy Swaggerts of America and the Sunday morning TV angel- and evangelicals and the war on drugs and just say no. And soon every day, you know, Geraldo Rivera, Sally, Jesse Raphael, every evening, Ed Bradley, 60 minutes, uh, congressional hearings. I didn't even yeah. mention that there are yeah. congressional hearings about the SRA and the satanic cults, uh, committing all these sex crimes, magazines, chick tracks, TV specials, you know, made for yeah. TV movies with all Tom Hanks. Yeah. I don't even think you mentioned that Tom Hanks was in that movie. Yeah, I, I mentioned. Oh, that. did you? Yeah. Cool. Yeah. yeah. Uh, um, that was like one of his first roles, actually. Yeah. Like, it's like right from there he went to Booze and Buddies. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I think that when folks look at it. I, I think that they look at it and they're just like, Oh, I can't believe how these people fell for this, but I don't yeah, think they, I don't think they take into amount the media saturation. Exactly. That's, that's yeah. in, that was involved, like involved in it. Um, and it was everywhere too. I mean, if I remembering it, it you couldn't get away from it. I mean, it, no matter it, the minute someone saw you with a book or even the dice or something, you heard it from somebody. <laughs> I mean, there, we weren't able to play in like libraries because really? people, yeah, people would literally come up to us in the libraries and be like, look, you're not allowed to play those satanic games here. And we're like, <laughs> instead of arguing, we would just take our stuff and leave, yeah, you know? Right. But yeah, it was, uh, we, it was tough finding places as kids. We were tended to go to each other's houses um, because you couldn't, there was really no social place you could go uh, near us as far as like game stores or anything that really there aren't any yeah you know they're all dying breed anymore right um, yeah they're with the comic shops they're yeah. all going down yeah um so you know i just to finish out my notes here i'm i just asked myself why are these ordinary sane people why do they wind up buying into this you know why would a whole culture become obsessed over over this idea not just the dungeon dragons thing but this whole like this whole idea and i you know i've already covered it ad nauseum that i believe it has to do with the media dry like driving yeah. these things you know uh i guess you can say they were quainter times yeah the whole thing was a lot closer to a Salem witch trial, or you could say that maybe uh, we're all susceptible to these ideas and these things in our media every day in and out. And maybe it was more of like war of the world. Like maybe it was like more yeah. of like a war of the world kind of situation. It, there, uh, it's amazing when there's a lot of misinformation being put out there at, that how much people will actually believe. And then once you actually get to see the reality of that information, you look back and you're like, how, yeah, how did people actually believe that? But I mean, that's also from a time like, you know, we mentioned with stranger danger, you know, yeah. there was rampant, uh, child abductions there, uh, mass or not mass murder, serial killings were up then too. Um, it, uh, it was just a much different time. Uh, I, I honestly think now we're safer than we were back then, but, uh, as far as you know the the whole like association it's it's a lot of it's you know this misinformation yeah okay so what's your tw- what's your twitter hanger we're gonna um, we're gonna wrap it up my twitter handle is uh at azak 30 okay. azak 30 and f- facebook and facebook is clan sunstar cool yeah. So if you guys know of an organization like Mike's trying to do, or if you're interested in it in your Pittsburgh area, or if you think you have something to offer and you're in yeah, Poughkeepsie, I mean, whatever, even, yeah. Even if they're looking for a game, you know, I, I run games, I play. Cool. You know, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm always looking for groups. I'm trying to, I'd even like to start like just a, a gaming guild in the area. You know, I know there's a number of them, but one of my goals with the this uh, nonprofit I forgot to mention is I want to start a yearly convention there would be two of them actually one would be in the same place every year and then the other one would travel from city to city in western pennsylvania okay and it would go from the whole way up from like erie down to uniontown like and it could you know it would help 
it would be the focus would be to help promote these different towns and to help them get some like extra money every year. You Plus, know? it's like you know you could be living next door to another D and D person, exactly. and not have any never idea. Know. Yeah. yeah, and never know, you know, because it doesn't come up in polite conversation. You know what right. I mean? Like, yeah, yeah, I yeah. Mean, it's almost taboo at times. And know? like uh, the internet does a long, long ways to probably help that kind of stuff. But still, like if I found out my neighbor was, you know interested in it and i'm right. interested in it like boom there you go <laughs> network connected right. you know and it, the internet it does have its uses as far as that but there i mean i have problems finding groups on the internet just because not everybody knows the same websites to go to i see you know and that's something else like i i'm trying to do is create like a network where i know 10 people that game well if i tell the new people i know or that i meet about these other ten people, then now they they, they now know each other. They could you know, cross, and it cross pollinate that can or spread. Yeah, yeah, and that's like another kind of goal. But I I'm, I'm definitely looking for people interested in forming a group together to start promoting the you know po- the benefits of gaming. Cool. Yeah. All right, man. You have anything else? No, that would be it. Awesome, dude. So yeah. thank you so much for coming in. I know it's been a tough week and all that stuff. Oh, well, and thank you I for just, having me. Yeah, I've had a lot of fun, and I think this yeah. topic is fascinating. I think we could probably rewind and go back and attack it from the heavy metal angle right. or, like, the yeah. cartoon angle. Like I'm The sure horror movie, yeah. yeah. Oh, mean, the horror movies for yeah, sure. Yeah, left them out. Yeah, so, um, you know, maybe that's something that we could do in the future. Okay. I don't know. But, yeah. Um, yeah, I just wanted to thank you so much for coming out. And yeah. I, I had... I I had a lot of fun and it's been awesome. Yeah, so, I definitely enjoyed myself. Cool, man. Um, so we'll just wrap this up and uh, remember to go to uh, iTunes and rate and review. Hit, hook, hit up the website, find the social media links at the bottom. Mike, uh, I'll put your social media links in the show notes for this episode, okay. so, so they'll be there. Um, and remember to hit up Patreon if you're if you're interested in that. Okay, see you later, everybody. <laughs>
he was on a bunch of stuff and he um he and colbert were talking yeah. about it colbert was like he's a apparently he's is a player yeah um bobcat goldweight played okay and uh, um vin diesel yeah vin diesel yeah um, Jason Mewes of Jay and Silent Bob. Okay. Um, well, he's also a Scientologist, so those r- rule each other out. Yeah. Oh, no. Mewes, you uh, said? Yeah, no, no, Mews, I was, yeah. no, I was thinking of Jason Lee. Oh, yeah. yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> yeah, no, Jason Mewes. He, uh, he plays D&D. Um, Robin Williams played D&D. Really? That's yeah. interesting. I could see, yeah. Yeah. I, he, can you imagine trying to get a, a word in edgewise playing with him? Though? Oh, God, I would have, <laughs> I, I would have done anything to get into that game. That was my, like my dream. He, <laughs> He, him and, uh, between him, George Carlin and Richard Pryor, that was like my inspiration to, uh, I, I, in between being, a, wanting to be a writer, I want to do stand up comedy yeah. too. And, uh, like once I found out he played D and D, it was like, if he can do it, I can do it. Yeah. You know? And, and so that's kind of like been kind of my inspiration from there, you know, and us having the last, same last name. I'm not related to him in any way, shape or form that I know of. I wish I was, you know, that would, <laughs> that would have been great, but um, it, he's definitely been like my biggest influence, but finding out that he played was like one of those, you know, it almost normalized it for me, Yeah, you know, and that, that definitely, um, was one of them first stepping stones. Like, uh, my, my main idea with this whole group though, um, it didn't come until just recently. Um, as you know, my, my grandma passed recently. And, yeah, um, my condolences, man. Oh, thank you. But um, I'm not one to really like think of like people visiting you in dreams. But there's been two instances in my life that because I had a dream, my life changed completely. The first one was when I was drinking. I was a heavy drinker. I drank every day. Uh, my parents, I have ADHD. And when it first came out that there that existed my parents didn't know what it was so they didn't take me to the doctors and that they would give me beer every night whoa well after a few months they 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 tried to quit i would just sneak out and grab more and it got to a point where they would buy two cases a week and i was able to go out and just take two three beers a night and just get you know i was just a little tiny skinny kid so it didn't take much but over the years, I built a slow tolerance up to it, and so I, w- I would drink more and more and more. Um, there were times I'd be in, uh, like, homeroom of high school, just passed out on my desk. I mean, I was hammered. <laughs> yeah. um, but I had this dream um, right before I turned 30 of you have two paths in life. Either you go and keep drinking and partying and having a good time, and your life will end relatively soon. Or you can stop, and your life will go for a long time. Well, I quit Um, within months after that, um, like things just changed dramatically for me. Um, And then recently, after my grandma died, I had a dream where she came to me and told me, you need to help the kids the way you found help. And so it kind of like got me on that idea of, well, I learned through the game. Like I literally was self-taught through a lot of stuff. And so that kind of inspired me to, you know create this organization and and try to you know just get it out there i mean it's it's a way to represent you know a community that exists that like people when when you go to a game store and you're a gamer you look and look around and just be like i'm with people i know right. even if you don't know them yeah i'm with people i know it's like me walking into a comic book shop yeah yeah like i get it yeah, yeah. Uh, you know <laughs> i uh you get that feeling any com or any any comic shop or any game shop you walk into and that's a that's just like such a welcoming feeling like uh you know and, and it happens literally it's a way anywhere. for you to kind of let your guard down yeah like you're like uh i can lower my shields for a minute yeah you know? <laughs> yeah you don't have to worry about you know and, and i know like the the social issues the, of high school are, are long gone you know i don't worry honestly i've gotten to a point in life where i don't care what people think you know because yeah. it their opinion only matters if I let it matter. Right. You know, uh, it's got, yeah. And you, you know, if we can teach these high school kids, cause that's where a lot of the, like cyber bullying and that, um, I think through the mentoring thing, like we can help kids, you know, show that like, just because other people are saying you're fat or you're stupid or you're ugly or whatever, it doesn't matter. Yeah. You know, you can build your own 
life off of how you want to do it. You know, it doesn't matter what other people think. Yeah, and, and like fellowshipping around a table yeah, with people, looking at people in the yeah. face and communicating well, with them. Planning um like the combats. Yeah. I have I've literally sat in rooms with people for like an hour just plotting a three minute combat. You know? <laughs> yeah. And it, it literally had to be so detailed down to like, okay, you take three steps to the left. You know, you fire off this. Yeah. And like, we literally went step by step each person, like, cause, uh, we would roll initiative and then we would say, okay, who's first, who's second, who's third. And we would go and sit down and plan everything out, you know, but that helps build tactical. Yeah. You know, it helps in all sorts of different ways. Well, yeah. You're like, okay, who's got the long range attack? Exactly. Who can provide smoke? You know, like just yeah. like who could throw a smoke grenade to like obfuscate their view? Exactly. You know, like, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's stuff like I learned that kind of stuff in the army and in, right. the, in the mosh pits of the Agora <laughs> right? in, yeah. in, in Cleveland. You know right. what I mean? But like that stuff that, you know, kids should know. You right. Know, and you they're know not who, getting taught. I don't it. think so. Yeah. It's so. um Hey, do you ever, uh, um, do you ever play t- Tunnels and Trolls? I've heard of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I, uh, I got in a big beef with Tunnels with the Tunnels and Trolls guy a few years okay. ago. He stole a lot of my artwork. Oh, okay. I heard about that. Yeah, he was stealing a lot of people's stuff. Yeah, he like yeah. he just happened to steal mine. And when I by the time I got into it with them, I had found just like years of him just abusing oh, people's artwork yeah. and i went i went ape shit on him and i eventually got bleeding cool news and the nerdist involved oh wow they fucking did like hit pieces on the guy because i like sent him uh you know my artwork right. that i did and and uh sh- links to his website and stuff and oh wow eventually i like me and the guy who wrote i was writing a module for the because it's open source yeah sort yeah. of so i was like writing i was doing artwork for a guy who was like doing a, a module right. for tunnels and trolls so it was like me and him that like took fucking took jim shipman down uh, and i like uh that's when it, what's up yeah the, I, I fucking i love it and that, uh now unfortunately i don't like to party because the guy's dead like right. he, he passed yeah. away but like i'm i'm one of the dudes that ripped that fucker's okay. website down okay and i was just awesome like, in your face yeah. you motherfucker yeah it's funny because i know professional wrestling people like yeah. all over the world or not all over the world all over this part of the country okay he was in indiana somewhere and i had a buddy that was like yo i'll go pay this guy a visit I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> you don't gotta do that like it's cool. right yeah that's cool <laughs> yeah. that's cool yeah he was a jag off I, yeah. I i remember hearing a lot about him taking people's stuff i almost submitted um stuff to him actually i the other one that people don't talk about is sambedia the guy who made riffs okay he has this uh if you send him anything he makes you sign a disclaimer or a waiver that gives him full right to all your stuff that you sent him whether he pays you or not whether he pays you or not well why would he bother paying you exactly (laughs) that's so like people stopped sending him stuff they quit submitting his i'm surprised they're still around to be honest like he won't change anything he he's stayed the same the whole time but he i'm i'm waiting for riffs to actually go under Uh, it's a matter of time the coolest thing about riffs is all the licensing Mm -hmm. and how he was able to like do that i can't remember what it's called like multiverse the the generic system the the multiverse or something like that it was um
Living 